colors are all around us. I mean, the way humans work, we're used to working in bright color. We use color to communicate. We use color for signs. It's one thing to wear a black business suit, but to wear a black leather suit. <laughs> Colors tell us about ourselves. Sensitive musician types and people like that will use a color to kind of put up a wall. Colors tell us about each other. They also hold a history of secrets that tell us about our past. How many myths are there of the sun is born in the morning and then it dies at night and after death everything turns black? Black means evil, fear, darkness. Ideas that date back to early literature. Fairy tales originated in oral tradition, in folk tales of peasant culture. And so we have to imagine a world in which there are no streetlights, a world in which when you step outside your door at night, it's total darkness and alive with danger. But why are we afraid of the dark? When you're looking at sort of how we see in the dark, the first thing you need to have is a little bit of an understanding how the human eye works. When you open up the eye, okay, um, the light sensitive part is of course the retina at the back. Okay. Now when we see color, we're using something called our cones. These cones are only sensitive in bright light. As the light gets dimmer, we move to using something called our rods. And the rods have no color sensitivity. They just have light and gray. So without that detailed vision, how we see in the dark and what we see in the dark is quite different from what we see when we're seeing in full color. And this is probably why people tend to get more nervous in the dark in the black. In Hansel and Gretel, the children are left there in the darkness. And it's partly the unknown that makes the darkness so frightening. They get up and they try to find their way back to their home, but instead they find their way to an amazing house made of candy and cookies and cake, inhabited by a wicked witch who wants to eat the children. There's always that feeling in a fairy tale that what you can't see in the darkness of the forest could be harboring something that is evil or something that is going to bring danger to you, whether it's an animal or, in this case, a witch. I think that the, the negative stereotype in, uh, in fairy tale literature and in children's literature of the evil which, again, is, is still related to this whole concept of let's pick something that's our worst fears, let's pick something that we want our children to stay away from for sure, we're going to call that a witch. Satanism and witchcraft became synonymous at some point in time. Satan is a Christian construct. It's their god. It's part of their dichotomy of the world of good and evil. We don't have such a good and evil kind of thing. the way we practice and worship is different. It doesn't make it bad or evil, but because it has stayed hidden for so long and because it was a cult, it's been perceived as being part of this other that must be kept at bay and kept away.
Then where did these images come from? That uh, tradition of associating the witch with a pointy hat and uh, a black dress and a broom, those associations build up over time in uh, superstitions, but also very much iconographically. How do you represent the, uh, the old crone or the evil woman or the witch? The illustrators are the ones who bring out the association of black clothing with the witch. Also in fairy tales, the idea that the inside is manifested outwardly. So if you were an evil person, you would be wearing black. While witchcraft holds some of the answers, there's much more to uncover about our fear of the dark. The other thing we have to remember about black is often there is this link culturally between sunrise and sort of the beginning of life and sunset and dark and death. Something we forget in modern society too is that for the vast majority of human history, most activity took part in the daylight hours because you didn't have electric lights. We have to stop things when it gets dark because we can't see anymore. We can't read in the dark, we can't see in the dark, we can't do all this sort of human activities that we normally engage in when it is black as night. How many myths are there of the sun is born in the morning and then it dies at night and after death everything turns black? Life is so precious because I see it can be taken away in a moment's notice. Being a funeral director is a very, first of all, rewarding job because we get to help people at the most difficult time in their lives. For many of us, black is the color of mourning. It's worn to symbolize the loss of a loved one. People coming to funeral homes still traditionally wear black. Black is dark, it's not bright and cheery. It is sort of drab and it lets people know that they are in mourning and that there's been a death. The 19th century established black as the color of death. The era that solidified kind of black as a color of mourning and for example white as a color of wedding um, was the Victorian period it became obligatory to wear black mourning dress. The closer the person to you, the longer you wore black, and then you could wear half mourning, but there was a huge industry that sprang up around that. The 19th century was an era of urbanization and disease and the Industrial Revolution and all of those things, so the death rates were very high. The association between black and death can be traced back as far as ancient Egypt. In ancient Egypt, in the actual funeral, there's not a lot of black, but there is one very important black thing, and that's the god Anubis. He's usually shown as a human being with the head of a dog, but he can be all dog. He's an interesting character because he's an animal who's been co-opted. There were probably really jackals and wild dogs roaming around the burial grounds of Egypt, you know, digging up your grandmother and chomping on her arm bones. We don't want that to happen. So what you do is you co-opt those animals. You make them gods. You make them the protectors of the underground and the protectors of the dead. So why is he black? I think he's black for a couple of reasons. A dead body will darken, will blacken, in fact. I think it's partly reflecting that, that he is part of the world of the dead. But in Egypt, that world of the dead is also the world of this renewal of the soil every year. So by making him black, we're associating him with Osiris, and it's associated with him, because every year when the Nile flooded, beautiful thick black soil would come down from Central Africa, and that would revitalize the soil. So the god Osiris has a black face to show you that even though he is in the soil, he is going to renew you and be refreshed. And 
that's what Anubis is. Anubis is not the dog who scatters the bones of a dead person. He is the god who gathers those bones together and wraps them up. He's the god of embalming. He looks after us when we're dead. I got the screensaver on my computer of Anubis, and if I ever get the nerve to get a tattoo, that's what it's going to be. When we get into it and we're talked about embalming and the history of embalming, uh, it goes all the way back to the Egyptian period. So basically this is just an extension of what they do. Obviously we don't mummify bodies anymore, but back here in this room, if we're not careful, we can chemically dehydrate. First time experience at funerals can be very frightening. People don't know what their expectations are. A lot of society thinks weird and wacky things happen when someone dies. Our heart just stops beating. Our bodies start to decompose right away. So we embalm to slow that procedure down so that the families can have their two or three days of visitation and for their friends to come in and pay their respects and view the body. The predominant color of people visiting the funeral home and paying their respects. Uh, black is very predominant. Darker colors are a sign of remorse, mourning, History, too, as well, states black is the morning color. Typical dress code for Western culture would be for women to dress conservatively uh, in nice clothes and for a man to wear a suit and a tie, again, typically in dark colors. In a different place, at a different time, the same black suit needs something very different. Here in the financial district, a black suit means power. Black suit is, um, doesn't have any pattern, it's, there's no distraction, so all you see really is the, the silhouette of the man and it's a very powerful image. Uh, black is a versatile color in suits because it's a blank canvas, so you really have a wide range of options in terms of how you want to express yourself. Black is such a popular color in fashion um, for a lot of reasons. I think it's very versatile and I think it also has important connotations of authority, I would say, and masculinity traditionally. It had been worn um, since medieval times and it had almost a monastic connotation, a religious connotation. Then it really only became a fashion color in the Renaissance. We think of it as maybe a neutral color, a color that's not difficult, but it really was one of those very high status colors. It was something that was worn in the highest echelons. And in the 19th century, like some other colors, it was a very difficult color to get a rich, pure black dye. So you could tell if someone didn't have the class status to have a rich, um, kind of pure black. Basically, I don't think they synthesized aniline dye until the end of the 19th century, when it really became easy to do a chemical dye, which could be mass-produced. It's a complex shift between the 18th and the 19th century, from an emphasis on surface embellishment to an emphasis on cut and fit. Men's fashion also starts to be mass produced. So people are seen as you're churned out, you're identical, everyone's on the same level. And it, that happens for women's wear in the 20s because the shapes are a lot simpler so they can be mass produced. And people talk about Chanel's little black dress and she says it's like the Model T Ford. So it's, you know, it's like churning out a commodity. Any woman can wear a little black dress. Any woman can own a little black dress and it will be perfect for a variety of occasions. But can any woman look slim in a little black dress? When you look at the idea of is black slimming, well this probably relates back again to how the human eye works. If it's a darker color, it tends to move the eye away from it. You're going to see someone in black, but your eye is really going to be more attracted to the brighter things around it. So the black thing probably seems to become less noticeable. It's one thing to wear a black business suit, 
but to wear a black leather suit <laughs> has very different, um, the material is so different, but the color, I think people are almost subconsciously associate that color with authority, you know, but it's really the, the material and the use that, that, that changes. When it comes to sex, black dominates the bedroom. In terms of the leather community, there's definitely a link between black and sexuality. I can feel very powerful in an outfit, or I can feel very submissive in an outfit. It's just like a little fetish thing where, uh, you know, people like to be submissive or in control. I don't know, like, you know, everybody has preferences and everything, right? Some people just like to be dominated. Again, and I think that goes back to the 19th century when, for example, um, the one set of women to wear black was horsewomen. And they were women who were uh, physical and they wore top hats, they wore masculine dress, but they also, you know, there's lots of kind of sexual content with them, you know, they carry a whip. The horsewoman whips her horse, she's in power over her horse, and she's very much a dominatrix figure. Women traditionally were seen as pure or innocent and white, dressed in white. The bride is dressed in white, right? But the dominatrix is dressed in black. They like to feel powerful. I guess for a long time, women were like inferior. Now they're trying to get the power trip. Everybody likes to be in power. This outfit I'm sporting right here. I haven't tried it on yet, but yeah, it's pretty popular. because It's all black. Mysterious. You also have your lovely corsets. They always put it with a little skirt or just panties. Makes them feel very sexy. I think it really would have at one point been associated with really like, you know, either sexual, pretty much sexual subcultures. Even to wear red, before red makeup was associated always with the world of the prostitute or the, or the actress. I would say in the 50s is, you know, the whole kind of, again, subcultures and, and kind of burlesque. It's always interesting to me how fashion takes something that, again, belonged to kind of these subcultures and it just turns it into a fashion. Black is a way to stand out, a way to rebel. I mean, the whole punk movement, the idea was to make yourself ugly or not beautiful. So, you know, to prettify yourself, the black makeup makes you scary. So it's not beauty, but it, of course the beauty industry then appropriates that. Women are more confident when they wear makeup. There's a lot of black and grays, um, but it like made everything look sexier and like smoldering and hot. And that's what women really like. And then, of course, there's the black liner, right? Which looks good on, like, any, any woman. In the past, eyeliner had a very different purpose. The ancient Egyptians used black for something else. They use it for their black eyeliner. They're very famous for this. Uh, now, that black eyeliner is lead. It's ground up galena. Now, it looks nice, but it probably also has a very practical usage. It is lead, and uh, there's a pretty good chance that uh, bugs, flies especially, who want to land in your eyes and lay eggs in your eyes, are going to land on an AI that has makeup and go, blech, this is nasty stuff, and go away. Uh, whereas if you've got nice clean eyes with no makeup, the flies are delighted and they're going to come and lay their eggs in your eye and you will go blind. So in ancient Egypt, uh, there used to be a practical reason why they would wear eyeliner. And uh, now, more so than anything, it's more of a cosmetic reason. It's to enhance your beauty. Also, because I'm a makeup artist as well, um, and a hairstylist, um, they always say whenever you go on set or anything, you have to wear black. 
It's so funny because the reason why makeup artists wear black is so that they don't stand out when they're doing makeup on people. A lot of the general public wear black because they do want to stand out. Fashion's very good at taking meanings and playing with them. It's kind of taking the, the traditional meaning of black, using it as a subversive statement. If it connotes masculine authority, you're thumbing your nose at authority. If you're a punk wearing black, you're saying, I have authority, but it's not a business authority. In the 70s, punk emerged as an outlet for rebellion, with black as its uniform. And I think punk at its best can be reflected in many different genres and medias and can be, again, like a, a unifying force, similar, almost similar to the color black, I guess, so that, that, that makes sense. Yeah, I think there's various reasons why different people wear black. Uh, black being an easily identifiable color, it's something that is accessible to many different groups of people, I think is, is partly why we chose it. There's also a kind of look too where it is a little bit intimidating. It can set you separate from a crowd. You can kind of use that as a wall to protect yourself. I think a lot of, a lot of artists being kind of uh, sensitive musician types and people like that will use a color to kind of put up a wall. It's also very strong and, and powerful and it draws attention to itself. And I feel like we express our music very forcefully. That's why we chose the media of punk rock. I think black goes along with that because it, it helps accentuate that statement. So people will take notice and listen to it. And it's important to have people listen to you when you have something to say. Protesters had a lot to say about Toronto's G20 riots. For the G20, people wearing black in the black bloc. Well, black there is a symbol of anonymity and a symbol of, uh, again, difference, difference from the group, right? It's uh, used to define a separate group of people who are very strongly opposed to the current state of things in our society. So I'm supposed to be working at a shoe store right in the middle of the action. Everyone's panicking and the road's blocked off by all of the cops um, at the intersection. And I'm just head outside to take a quick look. We saw it from beginning to end, the car blow up and just burn for a few hours. The black bloc, we saw them assemble in front of the store, planning what they were gonna do. They had black bandanas covering part of their faces or they had some kind of a black hat and just dressed really plainly. I was harassed walking home for wearing black. So I wear, I wear a button-up black shirt and black pants when I work. I'm a bouncer, right? And I'm walking home from, from work, and I'm being told that I'm an anarchist. The cops seem very, very willing to, to, to profile people based on what they're wearing and based on that particular color, which kind of shows its power. Black has lots of meanings for us. It's powerful, it's dramatic. I associate it with darkness, I'm sure most people do. It's oppressive when there's dark skies, when it should be sunny. It's certainly associated with death. The color black means uh, rebellion, it means uh, power, it means destruction. I usually start to think of some kind of power or extreme authority. I feel reverence for it because to me it is what surrounded the birth of creation. So the next time you rush off to work, don't forget to stop and look at life in color. <laughs>